Father's Day, birthdays, any time of year. And if you're traveling home and you're flying, you might need a book to read. I remind you of all these things. As well as, please turn your phone off. You'll hear me tell this joke a lot, but I never get phone calls except at important moments or when I'm teaching and my husband calls me. So please shut yours off as well. I first met this remarkable writer through her 2009 short story collection, How to Leave Hialeah, which won the John Simmons Award in short fiction. Characterized in one review as a, quote, sometimes intense, at other times darkly humorous collection, this book portrays daily life for multiple characters living in Hialeah, a longtime Cuban American neighborhood in the Miami area. We encounter, among other characters, children discovering a dead body while navigating the disappearance of their father and then their mother. A grandfather struggling after his wife returns to Cuba for a visit, during which time he quits attending their Tai Chi class, among other sins. A young girl seeking assistance from varied spiritual sources to bring Celia Cruz back from the dead in time to perform at a radio station's semi-annual Cuban and or Puerto Rican Heritage Festival. I love the and or part of that in particular. Um, finally, a young man whose barely known roommate dies in a shootout at a Chili's parking lot, leaving him to deal with an unwanted pet ferret. These stories probe complex relationships between heritage and the now, past and present. We see through and beyond these characters' perspectives, always with an eye to um, empathy and building and understanding, even as their voices are so diverse from each other and their perspectives are as well. My next encounter with this writer came through 2019's My Time Among the Whites, Notes from an Unfinished Education, which is a stunning memoir in essays. Please come join us. It was long listed for the Penn Open Book Award. I found the narrator, uh, I found the narrator Janine of these essays sharply analytic, bluntly honest, self-ironic, and compelling. I was first struck by experiential similarities and strange parallels between us. Parallel one, radical cultural and geographic dislocation. In 1983, I dropped out of college, long story, won't share it now, but I will tell you at some other point perhaps. And I drove from central Minnesota to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I encountered a world that had all the exciting diversities I craved, unfortunately with the same dangers and misogynies I had fled. In 1999, Crusette and her family drove from Miami to upstate New York for orientation at Cornell University. Driven to seek an education that she explains, quote, would plug me into a kind of access and privilege I didn't yet have a name for, end quote. In both cases, the dislocations brought irrevocable changes to self, to familial relations, to the narrative through line of our lives. Parallel two, encounter with and fear of the exotic other, signified in our cases by horses and the ocean. She writes in one of the essays in this collection, Going Cowboy, of leaving Florida in 2015 to teach at the University of Nebraska and of staying at a working cowboy ranch in an effort to, quote, see the real Nebraska, end quote. There she spent days riding a plain, quote, dull yellow blonde horse named Katie. Um, in a strange parallel for her, she'd also known a very mean woman in college who was a dull yellow blonde named Katie. Another, another great little moment that I appreciated. 
When a kind young teen girl reassures her that Janine would get it, that this girl had been riding horses since before she could walk, our guest felt her own foreignness more. She finds, quote, this offered up fact of the young teen's life unimaginable. As unimaginable as the claims made by Nebraska students and new neighbors I'd lately met that they had never seen the ocean and, quote, found its vastness terrifying, as terrifying probably as the moment I first slid my foot into that saddle stirrup, end quote. My experience in this instance resembles that of the Nebraskans. I always loved horses, and before I could get one, my father made me dig 100 fence post holes four feet deep with a mechanical post hole digger, which I did so I could get the horse I had her for a year, and then I discovered boys and sold her, one of the many sad mistakes of my life. Um, so I have always, my, my experience was positive vis-a-vis -vis horses. But my first experiences with the ocean, which I first remembered seeing in Florida, shook me. My perennial surprise at its shocking saltiness, having grown up swimming in lakes, and an evening where I barely escaped a riptide after too many margaritas have meant that I respect the ocean far too much to ever feel comfortable inside it much above my knees. But in reading this collection, I was moved far beyond noting parallels, in parallels to a, sta a phase of what I would call productive discomfort. Through uh, Professor Crusett's keen analysis of cultural collisions and self. In the same essay mentioned above, she shifts from wry amusement at Nebraskans who have never seen and fear the ocean and mockery of a pretentious French quartet who were also at the ranch to make a documentary about the cowboy experience to reflect on the owner's rant, quote, about Mexicans getting passes into the United States, end quote. This led her to consider how she was passing to the rancher as white, and quote, helping him perpetuate his ignorance by choosing instead to ensure her own safety, end quote. Moreover, as she notes, his anger at what he thought of as a free pass may have been misplaced but not altogether inaccurate. As she notes, there is a Latinx group that, at the time, did benefit from that kind of special treatment. That privilege, which could be described as a free pass to citizenship, had been extended for many years and for many complex reasons to Cubans. In this collection, her analysis rightly does not spare the academy. As she notes, and I quote, if I stop paying close attention, academia can be a comfortable, recognizable place. One where I am encouraged to buy into the falsehood of a meritocracy that promises the American dream to anyone willing to work hard. But I've come to see that dream for what it really is, a lie my parents had little choice but to buy into and sell to me a lie that conflated working hard with passing for becoming and being white, end quote. We are in the presence tonight of a masterful, ferocious writer and thinker. Professor Capo Cruset is the Miami-born author of three books, Leaving Hialeah, My Time Among the Whites, and the novel Make Your Home Among Strangers which won the International Latino Book Award and was named a Best Book of the Year by NBC Latino, The Guardian, and The Miami Herald. It has been adopted as an all-campus read at over 35 American universities. A contributing opinion writer for The New York Times, she's the recipient of the John Gardner Book Prize, the Hillsdale Award for the Short Story, the Picador Fellowship, and a Penn O. Henry Prize. Her fourth book, a novel titled Say Hello to My Little Friend, when we last spoke, is forthcoming. And we'll get to hear her read for the very first time from that book tonight. 
She's previously described it to me as Scarface meets Moby Dick, which I really find tremendously exciting. So please join me in welcoming our guest. Thank you for that introduction, Shereen. That was a lot of information. Um, and I enjoyed hearing all these weird parallels. So it's, yeah. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. I know there's like a there's like SGA meetings and something called choral, choral chorale. Cho singing is happening somewhere. This is this is a kind. This will be a kind of song tonight. Uh, mostly one of gratitude and um, and thanks for being able to you for coming and also for having me on your campus for this term. I wanted to start off uh, by thanking Professor Shereen Campbell and Kathy Barton for all your help in coordinating this event tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with a very brief, sort of like a little appetizer of everything to come. Um, and that is, I'm gonna read briefly just the very beginning of the story Animal Control, which was referenced in the um, introduction. But I also know that there's a course that um, that is being taught this semester where this story was assigned. And when I was a student, I always thought it was really cool when the visiting writer would read from something that I had been forced to read uh, or asked politely uh, by my professor to read. And so I thought I'd just sort of start off with that. And it is, um, it's one of my favorite short stories because it actually began from a writing exercise that I gave myself um, when I would be like, there just aren't any stories, I have no ideas. And I was like, that's not true, the world is full of ideas and I will find every single one and write short stories from them. So this one came from an exercise um, and found its way into a book. So this is the very beginning of Animal Control. Danny shifted the phone to his other ear and restated the question, this time using a tone the policeman would not object to. I would just like to know, sir, he said, what exactly I'm supposed to do, sir, with Eddie's ferret. He paced around the room, stepping over a box of Eddie's things, which his mother and sister had packed up the day before while picking out the suit for Eddie to be buried in. The ferret, across the room and in its cage, clung to the wire mesh with its nails, awaiting the pronouncement of its fate. Its water dish was empty, and it balanced on its back legs, standing upright inside the plastic bowl. Danny thought it looked like the thing was getting its graying fur ready for a bath. The ferret was officially his problem. When Eddie's mother had come for the suit, she said in Spanish that she would not be taking that rat. It isn't our concern, Mr. Cabrera. We told you that yesterday when you called. But I don't even like this ferret. It's not my ferret. On behalf of the entire Miami-Dade County Police Force, the officer again apologized for Danny's loss. Listen, Danny said, Eddie was my roommate, not my friend, not my gay boyfriend or whatever, so you can forget that shit about my loss, unless you mean the extra 700 in rent I gotta come up with now. The police officer was quiet. The ferret began chewing on the cage, jerking the wires back and forth with its teeth, something it had done nonstop the night before, when Eddie never came home. Uh, my point, Mr. Cabrera, the officer finally said, is that the ferret is not the department's concern. I can give you the number to an animal shelter if you want to surrender it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to ask you to stop calling us about this issue. Danny wrote the number down. He made the officer repeat it three times before hanging up. He needed to get rid of the ferret before their landlady could show the place to a new roommate. The landlady didn't allow pets, so Danny's dog still lived with his parents. But Eddie had gotten permission to keep the ferret by going over Danny's head and talking to the landlady himself. She'd never even seen a ferret, and he'd managed to convince her that it was only a little more alive than a hamster. The landlady had called after seeing the news about the shooting on TV. Danny hadn't been home, but the message she left on the machine was long enough to suggest that she hadn't noticed. It's not my Eddie they're talking about, no? Because the shooting was at that Chili's allí mismo, but neither of you have guns, so it has to be some other Eddie, no? Sorry to be una vieja metida, but I just had to call and make sure. Bueno, for the love of God, be careful out there. This Miami es una locura. Eddie did have a gun. He would told Danny that, but Danny had never seen it. Eddie had felt compelled, for safety reasons, to tell Danny about the gun, emphasizing that it was registered and legal. You're not living with some thug, Eddie told him three months before, just after he'd moved in. Well, I don't care if you are or not, Danny said back from his spot on the sofa. Just keep your shit in your room and you're pissing the toilet. According to the police report, Eddie had fired one shot before being hit himself. 
The other guy did a better job, getting him right in the heart, and Eddie was dead before the ambulance got there. The other guy died a few hours later at the hospital. Witnesses gave drastically different accounts, but most agreed that the fight had started over either a parking spot or a spot on the wait list at Chili's. Thursday nights were always busy at that Chili's, and a lot of car clubs used the parking lot to show off their rides. Danny had only been to that Chili's once. After finding a hair in one of the mozzarella sticks, he'd never gone back. That's what he told the woman from the Miami Herald when she contacted him for a comment. The reporter asked, annoyed, weren't you guys friends? He had a hard time hearing her over the ferret's crazed cage gnawing. He went to tell it to shut up and realized he didn't even know the ferret's name. So things don't go well for the ferret, um, but I'll stop there. The, the exercise, the writing exercise that I would give myself was I would read, I was so homesick around the time that I was putting this book together, um, this first book, How to Leave Hialeah, that I would read the um, local section of the Miami Herald for Hialeah and always kind of look through the police blotter. Um, and I would tell myself I had to keep reading until I found something I was calling the striking detail, right? Like just something that really stood out to me as like weird, which is not hard in Miami to find. Like that happens pretty quickly. And that was, and that was one of the few writing exercises where the actual event found its way in, back into the story. Like usually when I find the detail, I make myself write 500 words about that detail. Maybe a story comes out of it, maybe not. But it's just about like sit-ups. It's just about getting my hand moving, getting some writing done. And then I tell myself I'm gonna do nothing with it and I'm just gonna throw it away. And this was a way to try to train myself that not everything I wrote was gonna be published someday, right? Just get used to producing material and starting to pay attention to my gut about what I enjoyed working on. And that one just kept coming back, even though I was doing this every day. That one, I kept thinking about that ferret, I kept thinking about that guy, and it just ended up getting, I developed it into a full story because it was calling me back. Um, so it's one, so the detail that in the Miami Herald for that was like about the shooting at a Chili's that I was near the, my house growing up. And, um, and it said that like the deceased is, su is survived by his mother and his pet ferret. And I just was like, that's, what's gonna happen to that ferret? And then I just couldn't, it was in my head, right? I had to, I had to write about it to figure it out. Um, I am gonna read from this new novel. I'm not, I'm not delaying it for reasons of nervousness, although it will be the first time I'm reading it out loud um, in a real life space and not in a virtual space. But um, even since it's been, I think this is the first time I'm reading it out loud since it's been like finalized with my editor. It's coming out next June. But uh, before doing that, I did wanna read um, a little bit of sort of like, you know how you have like your appetizer and then you have like your pasta course and then there's, I don't know if, I guess we're at an Italian restaurant in this reading because then like, a, like the steak is coming. I don't know, maybe I'm just hungry. Um, but I wanted to read a little from a piece of nonfiction um, as a thank you to my nonfiction workshop for all the hard, hard work they've done uh, this term. And, um, and also to my, my honor student, who Alice is here, who's also working on a piece of nonfiction. Um, and just how much care they've shown each other in the workshop space and with their work. Um, so this is an excerpt from uh, the very first essay in, in my essay collection, which is called My Time Among the Whites. Um, notes from an unfinished education. So it's, it's a heavily excerpted thing. The essay is just like, again, just sort of a taste of some nonfiction. Um, but it also has another, the other special reason I wanted to read this particular essay, which is called What We Pack, is that um, I think I'm remembering this correctly, but next week on Wednesday, um, the 27th, is the uh, first generation, first senior pinning ceremony here at Davidson. And I myself am a first generation college student. Um, my very first novel was about a first gen college student sort of navigating through her freshman year. So I kind of wanted to read something that would show gratitude to the first gen students here and sort of honor them a little bit so again, this is a heavily excerpted, quick little essay before we get into some more fiction. Um, so this is from What We Pack. It was a simple question, but we couldn't find the answer in any of the paperwork the college had sent. How long was my family supposed to stay for first year student orientation? This may seem like an easy enough question to answer now, but this was 1999 and Google wasn't yet a verb. And we were a low-income family, according to my new school, without regular internet access. I was the first in my family to go to college, making me a first-generation college student as well as a first-generation American, as my parents were born in Cuba. So we didn't know that families were supposed to leave campus pretty much right after they unloaded your stuff from the car. We all made the trip from my hometown of Miami to what would be my new college home in upstate New York. Shortly after arriving on campus, the five of us, both my parents, my younger sister, my abuela, and me, 
found ourselves listening to a dean and his welcome speech with the words, now parents, please go. Your child is in good hands. Time to cut the cord. Go home. Almost everyone in the audience laughed, but not me and not my parents. They turned to me and said, what does he mean, go? My abuela asked my sister in Spanish, what, what's he saying? A new note of panic in her voice because my sister had stopped translating. She didn't know exactly how to translate the dean's joke. And she turned to me like something was my fault. She said, but orientations just started. I was just as confused as they were. We thought we all needed to be there for freshman orientation, the whole family, for the entirety of it. My dad had booked their hotel stay through the day after my classes officially began. They would be there another week. They'd used all their vacation days from work and had been saving for months to get me to school and go through our orientation. This confusion isn't the most common or problematic issue first-generation college students and their families faced, not by a long shot, but it shows just how clueless and out of our element we were. Another example. Every afternoon during that week, we had to go back to the only department store we could find, a now defunct Ames, for some stupid thing we hadn't, know was, hadn't known was a necessity. Something not in our budget. Shower shoes, a bathrobe, a plastic soap holder. We hadn't realized the bathroom situation would be a communal one. In fact, we hadn't thought about the bathroom situation at all. Extra long twin sheets, mesh laundry bags. Before the other families left, we carefully watched them because they looked at ease, like they knew what they were doing. And we made new shopping lists with our limited vocabulary. Those things that lift up the bed, we wrote. That plastic thing to carry stuff to the bathroom. My family followed me around as I visited department offices during course registration. Only four classes, they asked, assuming I was mistakenly taking my first semester too easy. And I'd agreed. Like most high schoolers, I'd taken six classes every year, so four seemed like nothing. This kind of assumption being one of the more common first generation college student mistakes. One I thankfully didn't make. They went with me to the campus store to buy my books, and together we learned what the stickers on worn copies promised, used saves. They walked me to orientation events they thought they'd also be attending, and to buildings I was supposed to be finding on my own. They waited outside those buildings so that we could all leave from there and go to lunch together. The five of us wandered each day through the dining hall's doors. You guys are still here, the overly friendly person swiping ID cards said after day three. They sure are, I chirped back, learning via the cues of my hallmates that I was supposed to want my family gone. But it was an act. We sat together at meals amid all the other students already making friends, my mom placing a napkin and a fork at each plate, setting the table as we did at home. I don't remember the moment they drove away. I'm told it's one of those instances you never forget, that second where you realize you're finally on your own, a feeling of fear mixed with freedom, and also, I'm told, with relief. But for me, it's not there. Perhaps because when you're the first in your family to go to college, you never truly feel like you're there on your own. They did eventually leave. Of course they did. And a couple weeks into classes, I received the topics for what would be my first college paper in an English course on the modern novel. I might as well have been my abuela trying to read and understand them. The language felt that foreign. I called my mom at work and in tears told her that I had to come home, that I'd made a terrible mistake. She sighed into the phone. I heard the chatter of her two-way radio behind her, electricians asking questions about permits and supply deliveries, asking my mom who the workers called base since she worked from an office for updates. She turned down the volume and said, just read me the first question, we'll go through it a little at a time and figure it out. I read her the topic slowly, pausing after each sentence, waiting for her to say something, just an mm-hmm or the conversational throw me a bone of okay, the first topic was two paragraphs long. I remember it had the word intersectionalities in it and the word gendered. I waited for her response and for the ways it would encourage me, for her to tell me I could do this. But I knew my mother's, from my mother's total silence that like me, she'd never before heard these words. My first insight into how access to certain vocabularies was a kind of privilege. Of course, I didn't know to call this privilege, not yet. I hadn't yet obtained it. You're right, she said after a moment. You're screwed. 
Whereas parents who've gone to college themselves know that at this point, they should encourage their kid to go to office hours or to the writing center or to ask the professor or a TA for clarification, that it's not just their right, but their responsibility as budding scholars to do so. My mom thought I was on, on my own as she feared, as I feared. And while my college had done an excellent job recruiting me, giving me a strong financial aid package and telling me about the higher than average percentage of minority students enrolling that year, I had no blueprint or roadmap for what I was supposed to do once I made it to campus, how I was really going to spend the next four years. I'd already embarrassed myself by doing things like asking my RA what time the dorm closed for the night. As far as I knew, there'd been no mandatory meeting geared towards first generation students like me. Aside from a check-in with my financial aid officer where she explained what work study was, I didn't know and worried it meant I had to join the army or something. And when she had me sign for my loans, I was mostly keeping to myself to hide the fact that I was a very special kind of lost, a feeling shared by my parents who had no idea what they were supposed to say, who didn't know to make suggestions that seemed obvious to people who come from college-going families. This too is a kind of privilege, the resource of people, people who love you, who have navigated a version of the very system you are now navigating. I mean, I literally have no idea what any of that means, my mom said. I don't even know how that's a question. I folded the sheet with the paper topics in half and put it in my desk drawer. I don't know what you're gonna do, my mom almost laughed. Maybe, have you looked in the dictionary? I started crying harder, my hand over the receiver. You still there, she eventually asked. I murmured, mm-hmm. Look, just stick it up there until Christmas, she said. We have no more vacation days this year. We can't take off any more time to go get you. Okay, I swallowed. I started breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth, calming myself. I can do that, I said. My mom laughed for real this time and said, Mamita, you don't really have a choice. She didn't say this in a mean way. She was just telling me the truth. This whole thing was your idea, remember, she said. It sounded almost like a threat. And there it was, the beginning of a kind of resentment that many first-generation college students come to know, one born out of the frustration at no longer knowing how to help us. Yes, it had been my idea. I'd argued with them that going away to college would be the best thing for the whole family in the long run, but none of us could predict how vast that distance would come to feel, how it would move me into a different class of people, out of the class that had forged me, that this shift would remain a painful source of tension from that moment on. The racket of radios started up again, so much static and screaming. And my mom told me she had to go, that she needed to get back to work. So I got back to work too. And get back to work became a sort of mantra for me. I tackled the paper with the same focus that had landed me to everyone's surprise, even my own, at college in the first place. I did okay on it, earning a B minus slash C. I never found out how a grade could have a slash in it, but um, now that I've worked as an English professor, I understand perfectly what he meant by that grade. The professor had covered the typed pages with handwritten comments and questions, which I took as a bad thing rather than as a sign of his engagement with my work. And so I never followed up with him about my paper as I should have. It was in his endnote, the first one I had ever received in my academic career, looking like its own small essay, where he listed the various campus resources available to me the writing center, his office hours, that I first learned of their existence. My mom didn't ask outright what grade I earned. She eventually stopped asking about assignments altogether. And I learned from my peers that grades were something that I didn't have to share with my parents the way I had in high school. My report card had transformed into a transcript, a euphemism I'd deploy in December when my mom asked when my school would be sending her the former. My grades were the first of many elements of my new life for which they had no context. With each passing semester, what I was doing became, for them, as indecipherable as that paper topic. They didn't even know what questions to ask. And that, for me, is the quintessential quality of the first generation college student's experience. Though I wouldn't begin to understand this until long after I'd earned my degree. It's not even knowing how much you don't know. It's not even recognizing when exactly you'd stopped translating. So I'll stop there. That was, I just wanted to read a little bit of it as a shout out to the first gen people. Well, thank you. 
Okay, now I'm going to read from this crazy book I wrote. Um, sorry, I'm really excited to, when I was practicing this, I had to like call myself back to myself because I just felt like I was channeling a whole different thing. Um, and I'm reading this new work, um, again, to sort of, uh, to honor and show gratitude, this time for my fiction workshop. Uh, they've been focusing on revision lately uh, and working on new work and revising that work uh, the whole time this semester that I've been editing and revising this novel. Um, so this is, this is coming out in June of 2023 from Little Brown. And um, it's called Say Hello to My Little Friend. And the title has been approved by the publisher. So that is officially what it's going to be, which I was like, cannot believe I'm getting away with this. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd get, I was like, this is from Scarface. So I, did, I was like, am I allowed to? Who here has seen Scarface? Thank God. OK, good. You don't need to have seen it. But I was worried, like, maybe generationally, people are not seeing it as much. They haven't seen it. But it's hard to escape. It's like. In the, in the culture, you know? Okay, so this is the, this is the very opening of that novel and uh, this opening chapter. Like the, I know also like April 22nd is the marathon Moby Dick reading that's happening. Have fun with that, just reading that whole book all day and night long. Uh, I'm with you in spirit. Um, but this is the opening chapter of the novel. It's called The Sidekick. Okay, I'm gonna read it. Get excited. Okay, <laughs> sorry, the sidekick. The day Ismael Izzy Reyes got the cease and desist letter from Pitbull's legal team should have been the worst day of his life. <laughs> the reason being that his short-lived role as the number one unauthorized Pitbull impersonator in the greater Miami area had actually been his best attempt at a life plan yet. But now, his photo ops at Dolphin Mall, his appearances at the Two for Tuesday happy hours at the Hops Ale House in Kendall, his standing near, but never in, the entrances of several fading South Beach clubs, everything that had given him any recent hope about life after high school and not being forever stuck in his part-time at Don Shula Hotel in Miami Lakes had been deemed illegal. Copyright infringement, punishable with fines so large that the price tag of just an initial infraction was more than what he guessed his mother would have made her entire life in Cuba had she never left. He was disappointed. Although not born and raised in the county of Dade, only the latter being true, he committed to shaving his head daily to evoke the dull sheen of the real Pitbull's dome. <laughs> He'd practiced the snarky giggle littering his lyrics, memorized all the words that rhymed with culo, invested in a well-tailored well white blazer. Oh, real time out. Uh, it's a Scarface homage, so the F word's gonna be in here a lot. So if, that's, if you're sensitive to that, this would be the time to exit. He really thought he made a good pit bull, and he did if he kept on his sunglasses. Izzy's eyes were brown, not blue. There was also the issue of his height, as the real pit bull was an angry 5'7", and, and Izzy was blessed to have made it to 5'11 and a half. Great for Izzy's life in general, but not so great for the pit bull business. He charged less than he'd wanted to and crouched down in photos for exactly that reason. He was a reasonable man. He imagined Pitbull to be one as well. If he could just talk to him, cut through all the lawyers and shit, he could get Pitbull to see why Izzy needed this. He understood from the letter that discussing the terms with the man himself was not an option. So the time had come for him to fall back, to fall on his backup life plan. One he'd wanted to avoid because it seemed more inherently dangerous. And why go that route when he had in Pitbull an innocuous enough Mr. 305 turned Mr. Worldwide, a rapper who was really just a barely bilingual auto-tuned businessman ticking off the Latino box in the commercial music industry's checklist for crap with a resounding dale. <laughs> if Pitbull could trademark a word that on the page just reads Dale, if his brand was the only one allowed to remind us that Miami is an acronym for money is a major issue, even when money is always a major issue in every American city, then Izzy now had to double down and go back to the source, to the idea that came to him a couple years earlier as graduation loomed and as late night movies on cable flooded over him from the one television in his Tia Teresa's townhouse, he would remake himself into Tony Montana for the new millennium, Miami's modern day Scarface. What this meant immediately, he could let his hair grow back. A huge relief, as no 20 year old should play at being bald when nature hasn't forced it on him. It meant he needed a sidekick. 
his very own Manolo. It meant he needed to practice saying hello to his little friend and ramping up his usage of the word fuck. He'd need a pet tiger and a Michelle Pfeiffer, but really, he needed something better than a tiger or a Pfeiffer. He needed super Manolo. He'd need to watch the movie again, probably. He'd only seen it a handful of times, but he knew a role model when he saw one, the drugs notwithstanding. He needed something better than drugs, too, because Izzy's mistake with the pit bull route was that he tried to become that man rather than surpass him. This time, with this plan, he would have to surpass even what he could not yet imagine. So no, the day that brought the letter killing Izzy's first American dream was not the worst day of his life, not by a long shot. That day is still several weeks off, already known somehow to Izzy's better than a tiger, Miami's favorite and only captive orca, this sinking city's whale poached closer to insanity with every passing day, ever circling the concrete, waiting for him. What else does this whale know? Much that we cannot imagine, though we can try. She knows she's in Miami, Florida, but that she is not from there, that such a thing is impossible. She knows roughly the location of her still living family members and so of her mother, though, less, though this is less known than felt, which is the case for much of what we are calling knowing. She knows her show times. She knows she is called Tokitai by some and that she must respond to the other name given to her. It is Lolita, but of course that is not her name. We will never know it. She knows that people like the water, though she has no idea why, it's too warm. And so she does her best to drench them every day at noon, two, and on the weekends only, five. Why not? It seems to her that it takes very little to make us happy. And when we're happy, she knows it. She knows she is the most important thing at the Sequarium. And she knows somehow that Sequarium is not one of our real words. She knows no, be accurate, knows of LeBron James and his talents and South Beach. The moment he arrived, she knew he would eventually leave, his tank just across the water from hers. She knows something is wrong with that water and with the ground, and it, that it feels like a sinking, but no, it's the water rising from the limestone to greet, but wait, from the limestone below to meet her. She thinks maybe this is part of some greater plan to get her out of that tank, but of this she can't be sure. She knows only that something is rippling that was not rippling before, not at this rate or at this amplitude, that the sound of it comes and goes with the tides. And so every day she listens for as far as she can listen, swaying her fat-filled jawbone in and out of the water when her trainers believe her to be resting. And it is in this listening that she hears Izzy halfway across the city, city wondering where the fuck he was going to get a Manolo and a Pfeiffer and eventually her. He decides to start with interviews. He knows he needs to watch the movie again. He knows, he knows. But he's waiting for it to cycle back on cable before tracking it down on DVD. Because yes, he should probably watch the unedited version, the one with all the fucks and whatnot. Should probably deep dive into the, all the old school special features. But for now, he thinks he can move forward on the Manolo front. Granted, Tony Montana knew the real Manolo from their lives in Cuba. In the movie, Tony hadn't gone searching for his sidekick. But when crafting oneself into Scarface, one must take pains to move the right pieces into place. The way Izzy sees it, this early on, given the right attitude and the right Manolo by your side, the right Michelle Pfeiffer and better than a tiger will naturally come along. The mansion, the money, then the power. He didn't need it as much as he didn't need as much as the real Scarface. Just enough to move out of his Teatera's place, one of out of what he calls his apartment, which is really just her townhouse's former garage converted into a bedroom with its own exterior door. So he could come and go as he pleased, she said, when she presented him the option as his high school graduation present. He pulls down his yearbook from the bookshelf where there are no other books and turns to the back to where people had signed it. Most were female, but there were three guys, he counts them, two are named Rudy. And it is in these three fellow Hialeah Lakes high grads who have, the way he figures it, an automatic berth into the sidekick interview round. Two phone calls is all it takes to get the info Izzy needs to track them down. His tia Tere knows new people, was basically a central spoke in the network of Cubanas Metidas, their headquarters being the closest Sedano supermarket. Every Cuban of a certain generation knew her and her story, which was also Izzy's story. 
how she'd taken in her nephew after his mother drowned trying to cross over, how she'd raised him as her own, even though she'd never wanted her kids herself, she liked to remind people. If she didn't know someone, she knew their mother or their madrina, and so within half an hour, he has a workplace and cell number for each guy. The first one, the one not named Rudy, works at the T-Mobile stand in the middle of Pembroke Lakes Mall, right by the food court. It would be a better sign, Izzy thinks, if he worked for Verizon or AT&T, but whatever, dude's gotta start somewhere, right? Not everyone starts off as Mr. Worldwide prior to getting a cease and desist letter. Not a Rudy, his name is Giovanni. Looks pretty much the same as he does in his yearbook photo. He's even wearing a tie, though this one is T-Mobile pink instead of the standard issue black ones they sling around your neck when you first sit for the series of senior portraits. You can't keep it, just like you can't keep the graduation hat, also a loner. The only thing maybe different about him is his neck, which is for sure fatter, as he thinks, or maybe just stronger. Oye Chico, as he says, the endearment a holdover from his pit bull act. He slaps forearms with the guy and adds, it's been a minute. Ernie, the guy says. What happened to your hair, dog? Coño, look at you, you're fucking ripped. It's Izzy, bro, Ismael. The guy says, fuck me, like three times. So Izzy considers him back in the running. He already has the vocabulary. <laughs> He's got a break coming up, so they make plans to meet at this borrow in like four or five minutes. Izzy has to sit with his back to the heat lamped pizza glistening behind the sneeze guard to keep from buying all the slices. Thinking about rubbing his still bald head with the garlic grease pooling in each cheesy pizza crater also sort of works to keep him from wanting it. Six or seven minutes later, the guy sits down across from him, a Diet Coke in his fist. He spreads his knees so far apart, they knock away the empty seats on either side of him and says, are you fucking roiding, bro? They say that shit shrinks your nuts, but I don't know. Nah, bro, just listen, here's the thing. So I'm trying to be like the next Scarface. Like the rapper? I didn't know you could rap. No, like Scarface, Scarface, like the original Tony Montana, like her womb is so polluted. Scarface wasn't that ripped, and you aren't fucking right for it if you ask me, which you basically are, and I say you can't pull that shit off. Go on your bro, can you listen for a second? Hey, you know, you sort of look like Pitbull with your head shaved like that. <laughs> Except for the eyes, the guy says, smoothing down his tie. Fucking Brian eyes, Rex it. Oh, because you're such big shit working at T-Mobile, can't even get a job at a real place like Verizon. Fuck you, bro. The fuck you been doing with your life? I just told you. I need a Manolo. What? I ain't no fucking Manolo. You be my fucking Manolo of anything, freaking ESL motherfucker. Remember, <laughs> remember back in middle school math, you still had that ref accent saying parabola instead of parabola? <laughs> Straight up Manolo shit right there, he says with a good tug on his crotch. Izzy stands up and says, oh, you think so? Whatever, I did better than you in that class, so fuck that. He flexes his pecs feels his traps engage along the ridge of his shoulders and the sides of his neck, making himself as big as he can. Fucking weak ass motherfucker, do you even lift, bro? The guy rolls his Diet Coke between the, can, between the palms of his hands and laughs as he tosses a crumpled up napkin on the floor and stomps away. Go on your bro, the guy says to Izzy's back. You were always a little off back in the day. Doesn't matter now if you're ripped and full of roids, you're still fucking odd. <laughs> Izzy heads to the gym straight from the mall deciding he needs to live for a while before finding the next guy, the first Rudy. He has never taken steroids, but he watches his arms and chest flex in the mirror wall, wondering if the dough of his high school fat somehow absorbs steroids through the sweat of the dudes around him. Maybe he hasn't been cleaning the machine so well. He thinks of garlic knots and wishes he had like 30 or 40 to eat. He imagines them swallowed whole, filling in his biceps from underneath, the crusts pushing up the skin. He benches 10 pounds more than he's ever done, thinking hungrily of Greece, of Zbaro. The second guy, our first Rudy, is perhaps a bit forgettable, but was always, during the year they knew each other, good to Izzy. Having refrained from calling him Doughboy, or Pillsbury, or Baca Frita, this last nickname clinging to him since his elementary years in the Miami-Dade County school system, thanks to his stint in ESL. To be clear, Izzy was never fat exactly, at least not in a way he could own, like various rappers of an earlier era, Big Pun, Notorious B.I.G., both dead, only one from obesity. But he'd been chubby in ways that made girls think he would make a great best guy friend and not much else. Always he kept his shirt on at the beach. In the shower, staring down, he sometimes worried he was growing real breasts. Then, without trying very hard at all really, it melted away. Late puberty, who knows? And graduation brought a search for a job, and his part-time at the Don Shula Hotel in Miami Lakes came with a free gym membership. 
And now people like Not Rudy thought he was fucking ripped. And though this wasn't true either, his shirts finally did fit him well. The sleeves of everything tight around his arms and shoulders in ways that made people look at him, in ways that had let him pretend to be a stronger looking pit bull. His body had changed enough since graduation that our first Rudy, upon seeing Izzy, did not even recognize him. The interview with our first Rudy occurs at Westland Mall in Hialeah, a far cry from our last mall in Purple Oak Pines. What to say about the differences between these various spaces, what they each imply about the communities they serve, about the people who enter them? For now, it is enough to say that Westland Mall is, no matter how many times they retile those fountains, a dump. It is at a kiosk for cell phone cases, not even cell phones or their various service providers. It is that bad that our first Rudy works. Our first Rudy spends the opening minutes of his reunion with Izzy trying to sell him a phone case that will protect his device in up to 30 feet of water. The case is meant for divers, but this is not the angle he uses. He instead argues that this is the case you want if you are like around a lot of pools, or if you have a pool yourself, or if you go to the beach a lot, or maybe the Everglades, or if you have a friend with a boat. Izzy doesn't fit any of these categories, but he likes the case, how sturdy it feels, the way it makes his phone feel huge in his hands. When Izzy agrees to buy it, he asks if there's a discount for old high school friends, and it's then that our first Rudy realizes who it is he's talking to. Izzy pays for the case, 10% off, and leaves without mentioning his need for Manolo, because despite Manolo's sidekick status, he still needs to have some kind of balls. For Christ's sake, he goes on to marry Tony's sister behind his back or something like that. It doesn't matter to Izzy, because as far as he knows, he's an only child, and so has jettisoned this plot aspect. And our first Rudy's wrinkled dockers and the deep sweat patches under his arms and dabbing his lower back, glimpsed when he bent down to look in the bowels of his kiosk for a case in silver, the color Izzy requested, rightfully showed him that this first Rudy, as nice as he'd been in high school, could not even be Manolo's Manolo. And so that leaves Izzy with the third man, our second and final Rudy, who does not work at any mall. No, he, wor he works at La Carreta on Bird Road as a dishwasher. And when Izzy learns this, after arriving at the restaurant and asking to be seated in Rudy's section, only to be told Rudy does not have a section, he is as close to overjoyed as someone trying to reinvent himself can come. Because the real Manolo's first job in the US was as a dishwasher. Tony washed dishes too, alongside Manolo. There is a sign, a literal sign, taped to the wall by the hostess stand, saying, dishwashers needed. He makes note of it as he circles around the back of the restaurant, jogging between a dumpster and a stack of pallets, while thinking, we could both work here before quitting. <laughs> when Izzy spots him through a window in the restaurant's back door, Rudy is even washing dishes while wearing a hairnet, like in that part of the movie where Manolo is washing dishes while wearing a hairnet. Sweat coats his face and he looks miserable and angry as his dark brows interrupt the shiny film of his skin. He raises a forearm to his head and tucks his skull into it, and as he drags it across and over his head, he sees Izzy, who has decided to wave, sort of, and Rudy waves back, saying, hold up, I know that dude, to the steel trough brimming with dishes and hot water and a soap and mildew smell he can no longer stomach. He pulls his apron over his head, just like Manolo would, probably, and after wiping his face and neck and arms with it, heads outside to see his high school friend. Izzy cannot tell from the hug if Rudy remembers him fondly. It is the kind of hug where one man blocks full torso contact via the buffer of a cocked elbow, a hug with a built-in pushback. A two-handed hug, or the type where one hand rests only for a second on the back of the hug receiver's head before dropping down to the less intimate spot of a shoulder, would have indicated that Rudy not only remembered Izzy fondly, but that he was glad to see him here at his workplace. But no, it's a guarded hug, despite the back slapping and the, oh my god, bro, how are you, that accompanies it. And so Izzy proceeds with some caution. It isn't necessary. Izzy and Rudy are, in many ways, the same man, both young, both treading the water rising around them, both as yet unaware of how lost they are in the version of Miami that leaves them longing for little more than a life prominently featuring nightclub bottle service and a girlfriend with an impressive set of augmented breasts. Even before he hears it, Rudy is as ready for Izzy's plan as Izzy is. They are so primed for this adventure that had that arm not been folded between them, they might have, on impact, merged into one man. 
They sit behind the restaurant on the hood of Rudy's Nissan Altima as Izzy lays out his idea, knowing full well that he isn't sure what it really entails, saying over and over again that Tony Montana didn't know either. All he had was his ambition and a massive sense that he deserved better, that he was destined for something bigger, something huge, something borderline unconquerable. Before it, and before Izzy can make his mouth ask the question, Rudy asks one himself, do you need a Manolo? I do, I do, Izzy says. Do you remember the part where they both work at washing dishes and Tony gets fed up and they quit? It's after they kill that communist guy in the camp in exchange for green cards. I haven't seen the movie in forever, Rudy says. I just don't want to wear a fucking hairnet anymore. Ruby, Rudy rubs his hands together as if washing them or trying to start a fire. The night is so hot and muggy, but neither man feels it. Neither man has ever been any place where the air is any different. I don't actually know if that really happens, Izzy says, but I think it does at the beginning. Then he ventures, we should probably watch the movie again. And Rudy takes it up. We should, we should. Yeah, we'll stop there. Thank you. So we have to have some questions to earn dessert. That's my, that's my ploy. So if uh, you can have dessert without a question, you can. but we prefer hard. that we have questions. How about that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you have if one, you have one. one. Yes. But we will not withhold food. <laughs> yes. It's like a physical challenge to this space. <laughs> we would like PE credit. Um, I, I suspect, Janine, no one's going to start that novel and not finish it. Like based <laughs> on the reading, how engaging that was. Can you talk a little bit about where that came in the process of drafting the novel? Was it the first thing you wrote? Was it later? Because, again, I think it's going to keep people. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it, it still needs a little work. Um, and that's something that I'm sort of waiting on feedback from my editor for, based on where the novel ends up. Um, this happened with my first novel where I had what I thought was the intro, really the opening chapter, and then when I got to the end, I knew I needed to sort of revisit the beginning in ways that sort of laid a groundwork for the reader to, to believe what ends up happening. Not that, I mean, it has to, it's really subconscious and sub subliminal, the work that needs to happen. Um, but there, the, a lot of this actually has not changed much from the very first, like, there was a lot more of the whale's voice was the very, very first thing. And then I realized I had to maybe ease the reader into believing. I do think there's a, there, not that I care too much about the reader in my drafting or at all in, in the drafting process, but uh, when I started really seeing that this could be a novel and that it was going to be a, a, a long book um, or a book, um, I realized there needed to be a little bit of like an introduction that involved a playfulness but also human characters that then sort of segues into the whale's perspective. Um, and that's sort of how the book works, to be honest, too. That's like a, a sort of very, like a story that involves human beings and then sort of gets hijacked by this whale narrative. Um, and I mean, I'm really, I'm, I feel like I'm not doing it justice, but I still think that's like, that's where the Scarface meets Moby Dick thing <laughs> comes from. Um, so yeah, that was, it's definitely an opening that has been revised many, many times, um, mostly to make it a, a, an easier entry for someone reading it. Something concrete that you can grab onto rather than like this weird idea of what if whales knew, like what if, what if captive orca were aware of sea level rise <laughs> in a place like Miami and they knew it was coming and they're kind of hoping that maybe it's a way to get out. I mean, that's, it just felt like so, out there that I was like, well, I need something really like Scarface that like people know and I don't know, the two ideas sort of came together though. I feel like I'm rambling a little on this answer as a result of Zoom. Like Zoom has made it impossible for me to figure out when to stop talking. So I'm just going to. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'll do. <laughs> Who else has a question? Um, I guess my question would be like, how do you balance um, sort of laughing at and laughing with the protagonist throughout the story, and then also having readers empathize and sort of root for the protagonist as well, because it seems to be like a tough balance that you need to find. It is a tough balance, and I um, suspect that there will be readers that don't think I strike it. And I don't know that I 
want it. I think I, I think I'm laughing at the protagonist. I don't know that I think the, of the protagonist as even a real person as the novel continues. And he's sort of, I mean, the premise is right. He's like, I don't know if I even agree with what I'm saying, but there's a version of how I entered into this book where it was like, this is a person who's trying to be someone else. And so I don't, I, I sort of started with him as a caricature and he becomes more and more real to me as I was writing the book. Um, so I, th I think that's a good question in that it's part of what I need to address as I keep working on this opening chapter is that sense of balance. And I mean, did you think it was balanced or do you think it's too much making fun of him? I mean, I personally, I, I loved it because like I wanted him to win okay. regardless of anything. Um, I did think I was laughing at him, but I also felt like I was laughing with him with the whole Manolo situation. Yeah, I yeah. think the way I made it okay in my mind is that in Miami, you can laugh at someone and they don't give a fuck. Like they don't, they're like, you can laugh all you want. I'm, I'm living my life, I'm doing my thing. I'm laughing at you too. Like there's just this sense of really not caring what other people think about you. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, I think the way I'm trying to strike it though is through the, the voice of the book, right? Which is also part of what is pulling to some extent from Moby Dick, right? That really discursive narrator. Like there are whole chapters in this book that are just like, the, there's a little seed of like the, the chapter about like malls and that's akin to like the chapter on knots in, in Moby Dick where he's like, I'm just gonna put a whole bunch of knots and tell you about them. It's like, well, this is, I kind of was initially imagining this book as um, a book about Miami and then an archive of Miami of this like sinking city that, you know, between 20 and 50 years from now is just not gonna be there. Like, whatever you believe, like that's just true. That's just, it's just not gonna be there. So I'm trying to create a, a book that will serve to like when people wanna know maybe what happened or what kind of a place it was that could lead to so much disregard for that fact, right? Like the idea of like, no, we're just gonna live it up. Like it, this is totally disposable. Like I kind of wanted to have a book that was speaking to that. And I do imagine the book, initially I sort of thought it was being narrated by the whale. And then by the time I got like three quarters of the way through the first draft, I realized the narrator is Miami itself. And it's the city trying, like that's why it just moves wherever it wants. Um, so it was a hard, it's a weird project. And I'm sure there are places where it, it, it falters. Um, but I think those will be interesting things to, for readers to think about. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's a good one. And it's actually, so this is also being developed for television right now as a TV show. And I think that's going to be a really important question for me in, in that process as well. I kind of wish I had a pen so I could write it down, but it's like just the balance of like, I don't want him to be an object of ridicule. And yet I need a reader or an audience to feel comfortable laughing. Um, and I think, the, I think the way through it is going to be his pride. Like he just, he thinks he's a shit. So you can laugh at him all you want. He doesn't care until he does, which is plot. Yeah. Right, okay. Thank you. Thank you. One more and then dessert. I, I do have one, but I'm holding mine in reserve. Because We've I got one back here. Better. Thank you. I feel like I'm on that show where you like try to go over the water and then you fall in. Dude, what's that called? Wipeout. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you spoke about voice earlier. Can you talk a little about um, maybe how you establish voice for this novel that you've just written? Or like, did it just come to you? Or did you have a specific voice in mind? And is it different from other things you've written? Yeah, it's really different from anything I've ever written. I think in big part because it is, is trying to speak to the tradition of the marvelous real, right? You have a, a whale who's sentient and who can like in, in, intrude in other people's thoughts, they're communicating through water, like there are elements of this that are like the kinds of writing I thought I would never do. Um, but it was really exciting to do and it also was like, you know, it's weird, a lot of the drafting of this novel happened in, in the early pandemic when we really were all isolating and taking all of that very seriously and I started thinking, well, this has been this whale's life for years, like for decades, right? She has no communication with other whales of her own and like how does she keep herself entertained and it's like what kind of functional madness can she be suffering from that is keeping her alive and it was I'm not saying it was like a one-to-one -one thing but having to then like find ways of like every day waking up and being like oh it's another day here we are in, in this like completely alone space right like it was just something to that I was really thinking about a lot and I think the voice kind of came out of a like a mania in that space and then how to capture that syntactically um, on, the, on the sentence level. Like, I think these are some of the longest, some of these are the longest sentences I've ever written. I think there was a kind of like, 
not clipped way of talking. I, I've had I've had people who've like like read my work and studied it and like written like papers on it talk about the sentence. Like a lot of my sentences feeling like quintessential Miami or Cuban American sentences, and that they're I make really heavy use of the M dash, which I know me and my editor are going to have a fight about. But I think it's the most Miami of punctuation because you're constantly trying to get two sentences in every sentence. Like it's just like pack in all the talking, um, and that is something that. I think about a lot in how this voice was constructed. If it's if this is a narrative is trying to be Miami, there is no one voice for Miami, right? It's a it's got to flow and it's got to move around. And so there are parts that are very like sort of like really like smart and uh, aware of itself, which is really not a Miami thing, being very self-aware. <laughs> but there are you know portions of that of that city that that's the case. And then you also have. I think in the dialogue, that's the place where, that's very specific to these characters, how they talk, and very specific to their version of Miami that has raised them. Um, but that narrative voice, the overall voice of the book, was one of the things that was the biggest struggle to nail down. And it wasn't until I realized that I was trying to create a kind of like Miami syntax um, that I was able to figure out like, like what those sentences look like and how do I, how do I make them sound like what, like a city or like a place or like my idea of that place. I should say I'm not trying to speak for a city, but like my idea of that city. Um, yeah, it was it was tricky and it was hard and it required me to read these passages out loud over and over again. Like it was a very like I needed to use that as a method of a way into the voice. It was not something I could necessarily see represented. I had to read it out loud. To my, even as I was composing the sentences, I would read them and be like, no, 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 that's not it. And um, earlier versions of this had so much more back and forth between the characters because that felt more true to life. And then when I would read it, I was like, I can't be that true to life because this is boring and weird. It's like, you cannot say bro 12 times on the same page. Even if when you go down to Miami, like everybody's bro, like your abuela's bro, your cousins are your bros, like everybody's, even your sister's your bro, like every, like it's all, it's all over the place down there. And I was like, one of those little goes a long way. So it was also a lot of like scaling back of a voice that was kind of over, overdoing it in early drafts. Thank you for that question. I think you guys have earned dessert, but if there are questions, oh, okay, yeah. I was so um, I've always thought Florida generates more strong contemporary satire than almost any place. Right? Yeah. Um, and I was on Metro Rail once going to the UM to teach, and I was there. It was mostly a time of day when it would be me and um, it seemed primarily the domestic workers, right, mm -hmm. who were on the train. And this guy got on the train in a trench coat proudly flung it open, he was completely naked. And, and all the women on the train just started laughing at him and pointing at his apparatus and clearly ridiculing it, right? And, and he just stood there and he just shrank and shrank into himself and covered himself back up and jumped off the train at the next station. And that, that I always have felt like that would be something that would happen in Miami and nowhere else. So I, I, I guess I'm asking you, what role does satire have in this book for you. Yeah, I mean, it is a satire. It's like, I think the description we came up with was like, at turns satirical and some other crap. I don't remember the other word, but um, it definitely- Deeply moving. Yeah, yeah, that's what, yeah. That's what they, but it does. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I'm trying to, there's some really absurd things that happen, but they are not fiction, really. <laughs> like, or they're, they're, it's only possible in a, in a city like this. And I think that's part of what's magical about the place and what I'll miss most about it. Um, yeah, I, again, I think it's like, I don't know what the question is. I really liked your story. Um, <laughs> and that does sound, I'm like, when you said that, I was like, I feel like I'm related to all versions of that. Like, I'm, that's, I have an uncle who would absolutely jump on a train and do that. And then all my, like, cousins would be the laugh, like, the laughing. And then I'd just be there writing it all down and being like, I'm going to put this in a novel. Um, because I am horrified and I have to leave this place. Like, that's sort of how I felt about, about home. It's, a, it's this weird place that I feel deeply loyal toward, but also, like, that I need to hold it accountable for, the, for, for just, like, its behavior. Um, so it's very, it's very satirical. There's at one point a character is wearing a pair of sunglasses and he has another pair of sunglasses on his head and he's holding another pair. It just gets more, it, it definitely builds. Like, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta, you gotta build to that kind of level of silliness, but... Um, I mean, you can sort of hear it in these 
early pages that there's, but that, that's sort of where the whale comes in as a counterbalance because her story, I mean, it's also telling the story of how these whales were um, like stolen out of the ocean um, in Puget Sound and in that area. And like there's a, de the next chapter is a very detailed scene of the day Lolita was captured. And then it, it moves into her consciousness and all of a sudden we're back with Izzy on the couch watching the movie with Rudy and he starts to venture into the story of how he was pulled from the ocean um, on a raft, right? And brought over like sort of illegally, right? By This is like a smuggling operation that happens in South Florida where like people intercept a raft and help it get closer to shore, but then release the raft again so that they can come unassisted and therefore qualify for citizenship. Um, so it's like a industry that sort of exists down there to some extent. And it starts to weave those two stories together, right? Um, so the whale sort of works as a counterbalance to the satire. But even in looking at her situation, it starts, you realize the absurdity of it um, and the absurdity of like orca in captivity when they are definitely smarter than us. Like I read a lot of books. They're so much smarter than us. And uh, we like, if they could just not, if they didn't have to be in the ocean, we'd be so dead. Like they would have taken over already. So uh, that is definitely part, my respect to them is part of what motivated this book, I think. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was a great question. All right. I think dessert is calling. Yay! But could we please thank our guests? Congratulations on dessert. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I know it's Tuesday in the April and the home stretch of the semester, so like this is it's is a wonderful crowd. Thank you all for coming. We also have go boxes. Please eat. And there will be books for sale up there. <laughs>